Hello and welcome back to the Hansen cast with me, Emmett Lewis, and my co-host Mikael Christiansen. As you probably noticed, we had some dank intro music. Uh, we have to give a big shout out to Daniel Horvat, who uh, is listening in. Hopefully, he said he likes our podcast. He got in touch saying, "Can I help you guys out?" And he recognized how jank we are and how amateurish, and needed some style. So, uh, yeah, he stepped up to the plate, and I think he owned it. What do you think, Miguel? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's 8-bit, it's uh, epic, it's industrial. Uh, what more could you ask for? I mean, I even sent him some one of my favorite tracks from Final Fantasy VI when, um, when he asked for inspiration, and I think he did a good job. Yeah, I think so too. It was, uh, yeah, he nailed it. They're welcome to our factory. He even sent us a happy one, and we said, no, 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 give it's us something happy. dark. <laughs> <laughs> At so, least that one was too happy. It was good, but it was too happy. Yeah. So uh, awesome. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, yeah, if anyone else has things that they need, that they feel we could do better in our podcast, <laughs> please get in touch and help oh, us yeah. out. We I, are... Yeah, I, th I, th I think you need to like talk better. Can I do it for you? <laughs> <laughs> please just tell me what to say. Uh, cool. Uh, we have another shout out as well. Uh, so this person found this before we got actually announced it, but we have a buymeacoffee.com thing. And uh, we put it up and uh, he found it and bought us a coffee. So shout out to Charles, who uh, is fueling this podcast currently, which uh, I think Mikhail just had about a liter of coffee before we got in for this one. So I'm okay. I've only had Necessities. Two uh, needs must. Needs must. Uh, cool. So it's a QA and a quest. Uh, podsode? Podsode? Podsode. Okay, podsode. Yeah, enough. it's a podsode. Let's call it a podsode from now on. Uh, Q&A type one, as we do in between. And... As you know, if you have some questions you would like us to answer, uh, either DM them to us on Instagram, on handstandfactory.com, or to me or Mikhail, whoever you're following. Uh, or scribble it on a little piece of paper and um, tape it to a brick, throw it in Emmett's window. Throw it in Mikhail's mother's window, if you can track that down <laughs> in Norway, where he's going to be staying for the next couple of weeks. Fuck his mom. Here, crash her window. She would not. She would fuck you up if you uh, probably through yeah. window, yeah. I haven't even met her and I'm terrified of her. I know, she's lovely. <laughs> I'm sure she's lovely, but like, you know, I think she's a hardcore, uh, maybe it's my Irish genetics and the Norwegian kickoff. It's like, she's a Viking. She's quite calm. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> Vikings are always calm till they raid your monasteries. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have some questions as usual and a yeah, nice mix of them. Uh, so first question, what are the benefits of Stalder? And how do you those gains translate to one arms? Um, yeah, benefits of Stalder is that yeah, you can now do a Stalder press plus one to happiness. Um, <laughs> it's um, you can enter a handstand without jumping from almost any surface, so that is a big plus of the Stalder. And I mean, you have great control. Um, if you fall down from a handstand, like, and you fall way too far, you can always catch it in a straddle and press back up. I even remember I did that in a show with Seven Fingers many years ago. So like I was doing a turning one arm and I had to do, I had to return to two canes and I had to gather my, my legs set on my cue in the music uh, and then like drop to bent arms and jump down as the light change. And like I had just <laughs> finished a turn and I just fucking lose my balance as I catch on two arms. And like my legs fly down and I catch them in like the worst straddle L ever. And just pressed it back up and I was able to gather my legs on the music and dropped at the timing. And like, yeah. I bet you got an applause for that one. And I think I actually no one noticed because it oh. just, I guess it just looked like part of the choreo. Because I remember like when I was gathering my legs, when I came up from the stalder, like it kind of went with like the on the music and yeah. then boom, the drum hit as I closed my legs and I did the thing. But uh, it's it's a great move to learn, but uh, it, it won't really transfer much to one arm. You can be a total boss on one arm and not be able to staller um, yeah. and vice versa. Yeah, it's definitely one of those ones that's... Uh... <coughs> Sorry, just caught slight um, uh, case of the death. Death coughing, we're in an cloud recording space. Uh, where the hell are we? Yeah, so staller press. Yeah, it's one of these ones I think... Uh, the value of it for one arms gets overstated in some communities and yeah me and mm -hmm. make a boat know a host of people who are machines on one arm 
and can't do stalled presses. They can do standing presses, which has a has a lot of transfer to one arm. Yeah, it's kind of necessary yeah. almost. Yeah, it's definitely on your list of like, if you can't do that, you should probably be able to do that if you want one arms. Uh, one of the things I've been noticing lately with stalled presses is I've been doing some phases with my more advanced balancers and getting the stalled press pumped up has a very strong transfer to uh, 90 degree push-ups. It's, do uh, they? Yeah, hmm. I, I was wondering, like I just had some clients that were just getting pushed a bit too into the overtraining every now and then when we were training stalders and 90 degree push-ups at the same time. So I dropped, because stalders is more important to what they're training. So I dropped their 90 degree to once, either once a week or once every two weeks. And guess what? Their 90 degrees were just going through the roof and there was a lot of crossover. And the people were saying the same thing. It's just like, oh, they just felt like there was just more control. Hmm. And same with, uh, I think there's a good, not in every case, but I think there is, particularly we teach uh, Stalder, I think there's a good crossfire between straddle planche and Stalder. Yeah, there, there, I, there, I can, that I can attest to. At least, like, uh, if you're really good at at Stalder press, you will get like the shitty hand balancer planche for free. Yeah, like the kind of the the very piked uh, straddle planche that I also have a tendency to end up with <laughs> unless I train it specifically. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think I think that like for for me at least, Stalder is like it's just like part of the uh just like solid basic vocabulary that you should have if you're if at least if your goal is to move towards like the higher echelons of 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 uh, hand balancing it's just it's good because you have an extra way to get up you have a very just like strong degree of control uh, through the entire shoulder range and i mean if you ever want to press on one arm and stuff like that it's it's also just it's kind of mandatory like to have like at least yeah. like reasonably good Stalder press strength or else like some of the ranges has become like unattainable basically. So. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely the thing is like, is it needed to get a one arm handstand? No. Is it part of the handstand vocabulary that you probably should be able to do? Yes, yes. definitely. Yeah. So get on it. Get on it. It's also like, it's infinitely less work to get a Stalder press than it is to get a one arm handstand. So yeah, you for, just... for at least for for absolutely most people but yeah. i mean of course there are some that like it's it's like stellar press and all those kind of moves uh it, it's the type that is it is body specific and some are going to find it a lot heavier than others if you're very top heavy and have good good flexibility in your hips and shoulders it's going to be very easy if you're not uh if or like if you don't have a lot of force in your upper body or if you lack flexibility in the hips or like, or if you have heavier legs, it's just going to take you a lot more time to develop that kind of movement. Uh, so it's, it, it can be really tough to learn for, for, for some. And like, <clears throat> as I stated before as well, like you do need a, you need, do need some strength in like tuck planche, uh, to be able to get anything done, uh, with it from kind of lifting out of the straddle L or even an L sit. Like there's a certain range you can't pass unless you do at least have some kind of power in in a tuck planche. So there are several components that need to be trained for for that move. Yeah. Since amazing, get your stalder. Or don't. Yeah. That's one of those ones. I'm trying to think of some of the girls I know who can like I'm thinking of a few girls I know who are machines on one arm, can do basically everything. Can even press on one arm, but they can't stalder. But I'm like it's just, is it because they never trained Stalder or is it because it's like a strength thing? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a combination. I know people that can also press one arm from standing and have no, no, uh, Stalder. Uh, but it, it's like, since it's kind of like you, you can like the entire standing part of any press, you can kind of get around with flexibility. Uh, I do think that. A lot of it has to do with not training it specifically, but but it, it is a boring thing to train. And that that is what I've found uh, gets kind of some people with it because it's strength training. You can't, like if you're going to have going to have results with Stalder, you can't train Stalder every single day because it's like, you'll need to overload, you'll need to recover, you'll need to build strength and then move on f towards the full movement. And that isn't really the way that hand balancers train their <laughs> hand balancing work in general. So you it can be to hard it. to program. And also like, if you just don't have much lats and like front shoulders and all that, it's just, 
it's just going to be like a big chore to get it. And then like I understand that particularly performers would rather just spend time on the kind of moves that they want to perform and will perform. Yeah. So that it's it's useful vocabulary rather than like spending an enormous amount of energy on something that is kind of like, yeah, it would be cool to have, but do you actually want to put in the time to do it? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Anyway, Move next down. question. Uh, this is one for me. Emmett, I remember that in your workshop, you talked about people from another flexible mobility system came to you with problems of being, I think you called it rigid flexible. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that and how they came to be rigid despite working so much on mobility? Uh, yeah, this is an interesting one. And Mika has actually seen this before and was asked me about it. I think we talked about it before. But there's a lot of systems rely on building a lot of tension in the system for developing flexibility. You know, I use it as well in case points, but there has to be some kind of training where you're using the body in a low intensity, relaxed kind of manner. Because if we just look at the very basics of that adaptation from strength training, the adaptations that happen at slow speeds are not the same adaptations that happen at higher speeds. So if you're training a system that has like huge amounts of isometrics and heavy isometrics and all this kind of stuff, and then you're wondering why your flexibility isn't expressing at different speeds or in different manners, then that can be the key to it. I think, uh, the classic one is the person who has like an ISO split that they can do pretty cold and it's like they can hold weights, hold 20 kg and shit like this. And then suddenly you put them in a handstand, they're like, it's barely even legs 45 degrees, yet they have a nice flat split. Yeah, I've seen that too. Yeah, you know, I remember I was talking about this before. It's like you see this in these kind of systems where like it's, you have to think of that there's we are looking for generalized flexibility development that can express itself over a broad range of situations. Whereas if we took the specialized route, it's like, it's like comparing, say, strength training for a sport versus strength training for powerlifting. Whereas powerlifting can be very good, but you're trying to get incredibly, incredibly specialized at the technical aspects of doing that sport. So you get really good at doing the exercise, you get really good at the context you perform the exercise in. Uh, maybe it doesn't transfer directly to your jumping power or your jumping height or stuff like this. So it's the same with these kind of systems. You use a lot of heavy isometrics and overcoming isometrics. Now, there is a case to use them in flexibility development. Don't get me wrong. You don't throw them all out. But train this is where I always say in the workshops, you might remember I made the point that like it looks like strength training on paper, but it's not. The parameters and the goals and the intents we're using behind it are different. And this comes down to what I talk about is that we have to train all three relationships with gravity as well. So we have to work where gravity is assisting the stretch, gravity is providing resistance to the stretch, and gravity is neutral for a better expressibility of the flexibility. And this gives our, you know, some people say there's no magic bullet for flexibility training. Well, the three planes of gravity and the different velocities is the magic bullet for flexibility training. Uh, other than that, yeah, it comes down to like, you know, thinking that we have usable ranges so we have basically if we just train and we train for one thing only and we don't use it then it becomes quite rigid it comes fixed and comes locked in this plane so just remember that as well it's like okay well you know i've got splits or i'm trying to work on splits well maybe swing your legs around maybe look at how it works in your handstand maybe think of your relationships with gravity all these kind of things yeah like this this is a thing I've seen a lot with people that even people that are able to do like to slide into an ISO split cold. Uh, and when the same person does like a handstand and straddle, like the, it's not even, it's nothing. And I can't slide into an ISO split while cold, but like, even when I'm cold, like, I mean, my, my split isn't amazing even when warm, but like what I can express when cold in just standing in a handstand and opening my legs is quite a lot more than uh, a lot of people I've seen. And I'm not like the best example of this, but it's, yeah, like what me and <clears throat> Nemeth have discussed before as well. It's just, if you see, for example, in circus and gymnastics and dance and stuff, stuff like that, people don't really use that specific protocol to develop their flexibility simply because they, they are in like the environments where they where flexibility is always used so it just ends up being trained quite often the individuals are young and kind of yeah m more than moderately talented very often at least so like it'll 
it and and it it it's a culture for training flexibility whereas like there there isn't much training people just sit around in splits when they warm up and like fiddle around with it and like if you ask people how to stretch you will just get the answer yeah, well stretch a lot and <laughs> the interesting part is yes it's not very methodical but if you go into a circus hall and you see people doing aerials or doing handstands or doing acrobatics or whatever and you see the way they're able to use their flexibility and to just pretty effortlessly slide into a full split you will see like a very high correlation but or like it'll be very similar what they can do in terms of their just going into a stretch and what they can express through a movement and i think that is fascinating and i was i was actually very surprised by this when i entered into teaching and saw a lot of people in other fields that were able to demonstrate getting into a full split and then just like in the handstand, there was just nothing even remotely similar to it. And I was expecting them to like, oh, but why aren't their legs like almost 180 when they have this yeah. enormous flexibility? But then again, like one one guy I saw, like he would use a 20 kilo plate to get to and basically force himself into a full split. But like in, in his handstand, like it looked like what I what I describe as a small straddle when yeah. he was doing his split handstand. So it was quite, quite surprising this. Yeah, it definitely comes down to this. It's like I was talked about this on one of the articles on the M3 site where we have this biopsychosocial model of people who use it a lot for pain, but it applies to flexibility just as much as anything else. And we have, just to run down it, we have like, we have your biology. Like this is kind of, you know, say just your bony limits of your joints, where your joints can go to. They're going to be different for everyone. Blah, got that, fine. We have your mentality towards the training, you know, okay, well, you know, do you expect training to hurt? Do you expect a thing? Do you have an idea that you should be able to freely moving and it's not a big deal to do a split? You know, if you're making these things, big things in your mind, then they will be tenser. Then we have the social side where Mika was kind of talking on. I was like, well, if you're in a place that has a higher social value and social capital on flexibility versus, you know, strength or whatever, or an equal value, then you will be more flexible because of your society or in your know, societal creatures. So these kind of things go in is what I remember the analogy I was using in the workshop when I was trying to discover how to become flexible. I was asking people how they stretched and what they'd done. They'd just tell me stretch more, stretch more, do more stretching, do more stretching. But then when I'd look at these people, how they actually used it, they were using all their flexibility in these all these broad range of contexts in different, you know, obviously in relation to apparatus and circus and aerial or in their disciplines, they're using them at speed, they're using them to express something, but they weren't thinking a lot of the time, you know, now I'm going to do my maximum split. It was more like, now I'm going to make this geometric shape and I'm going to transition to a next one. And it's kind of, it's getting a bigger intent and context for the flexibility, which means there's more variety, which means we're not just doing ISO splits, we're doing maybe some ISO splits, but then you're also doing like, in an infinite amount of different leg inversions when you're going up and down your rope every single day without even thinking about it. Mm. So this kind of like broad usage, you don't say you have to take up circus to do this, but just thinking like, how can I use it more and how can I use it in a context that I have to use it, but it's not the main course, will stop this kind of rigid linearity coming in. Mm. Uh, I guess that's a pretty good take at it. Yeah, I think that kind of covers it. Uh... Got a question for the podcast. Next question. Hopefully this is not too repetitive, but it is about frequency. High frequent training has been mentioned in the podcast for the high levels as to five to seven days a week. Well, I'm a bit curious about stepping up from three to four days a week. I find that step difficult. For someone training in the push program, the push program is our beginner's program. Is it even necessary to push for four days a week? Am I better off taking that step when I start with keep pushing? Keep pushing is our learning the shapes program. Hmm. I mean, I I would ask the question to you: Is like, is are you currently making decent progress with three days a week? If if so, then that's fine. Like, to, it doesn't mean that like more doesn't necessarily equate to better results. Um, especially not when working on on two arm stuff. I think you can really easily like get quite a lot done with three days a week. But this will depend on your on your schedule, it'll depend on your ability to recover, and it'll depend also very much on like how, like how hard do you train, like how exhausted are you after these sessions? Uh, because if you would 
want to maintain a solid rhythm at four days a week, perhaps you'd need to do less per session depending on your uh, current recovery capacity and so on. So yeah, it's it's entirely up to uh, what, um, or to up to what is, is, is what you're currently doing working? And it's, it, it, that is also kind of a weird question because what, what everyone will always be asking themselves is, if I did more or if I did less or if I did X, Y, Z, would I be getting better slash faster <laughs> results? That is that is that is always the thing, right? Like including me, everyone is like kind of trying to micromanage or figure out, okay, what is the best way, what is the best course of action to make progress? Uh, and I like I think that is a, it's kind of like, a, it's kind of a chasing the dragon kind of thing where you never really touch the dragon. <laughs> yeah, it's like you, you, you're you're always trying to like uh, optimize and optimize and figure out this and figure out that. And yeah, sure, there's some interesting things about it. But if you uh, if you are currently making progress, if things are happening, if you are experiencing that, okay, hey, yeah, look three months back, okay, I'm actually doing a bit better at this, or I can stand longer, or I feel less fatigued, etc. Like, well, then you are something is happening. So. Um, there isn't any default question to this, but like, uh, and you did mention that you find this step difficult, and yeah. I think I think that is that is a good signifier on the, to the fact that yeah maybe maybe four is no point maybe four is something you can do later, and it it doesn't necessarily have to do with like what stuff you're practicing or what program you're practicing, but just regarding like do you do you feel that you're able to without that having negative impacts on the training itself or on the other things in your life basically yeah. It's definitely one of these things like it. Uh, it's quite easy to get the handstand bug, I suppose, and just want to do more because it's fun. And just yeah. one of the things you can do is instead of having a formal training session, just do 10 minutes. Like start off doing yeah. three sessions, do three formal sessions where you're like, okay, I'm going to follow the program laid out. And then just go another one, just warm up your wrists, warm up as you want. And just, you know, play this kind of idea we talk about play sessions, like try some stuff you're not working on presently. Mm. Just do it for 10, 15 minutes and be strict about it at the start because it'll you'll be able to expand this session eventually if you feel like, okay, I do want to train this four times a week. It's really exciting. You know, there is other things to work on in hand balance as well. I don't know what level you're at, but, you know, there's headstands and elbow balances and freezes from breakdancing and stuff like that. Like we don't have tutorials on these kind of things yet, but there is other things to learn that aren't directly related but they're gonna are in a similar vein and they can be quite rewarding when you're starting out mm. so there is these kind of things like to follow along and uh yeah just uh take it gentle yeah and like the like 10 like doing short sessions like 10 minutes and so it's 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 a great idea in terms of just yeah play play around with your things without having too serious of an extra of an approach on those days but yeah be be strict about it so that you don't like um overshoot it and uh, just to those of you who might be listening that are working on one arm thingies, I think that is not as good of an option because you need more time to get ready you yeah. might need um like your wrists might need it and so on so that it is harder to do short sessions with one arms uh especially when working on it since you're you're like there's so much force going into your joints and like the movements are volatile and all of that but um and also like if you are working on like higher level things yes you might need more days a week to be able to get through the various types of vocabulary you need to work on but it is difficult to balance um recovery with all of this so don't like basically don't overdo it because that is like in that is always just going to ne negatively impact you in the end yeah one of those ones like if you're limited on time on one arm like obviously a 10 minute session will do it but uh yeah just doing your one arm stuff you're working on like pick okay i'll just practice my balance on one arm and that's it and just like don't do your other supplementary work can be an option there for a limited time hmm just want to tell people is like if you're running out of time in your sessions or whatever you know the normal session might be programmed i don't know warm up exercises race through them then do your whatever 10 sets of saddle one arm holds and then that's it your session's done mm. like don't do your conditioning afterwards don't do the other stuff you need to work on is one option uh yeah other than that yeah it's also like when you're still in the realms of doing the push program 
it's you're still in the realms of building strength. A lot of it comes down to building strength, and like obviously there is strength involved, but you need recovery. Like that's the other thing. It's like so three days a week can be more than enough, and you'll get a lot out of it. Mm. Cool. Our next question. Oh, my tablet just died. So while I get that working, ripping bees. Ah, that's okay. It's working again. We have questions. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, probably near impossible to answer. Balancing time with practicing handstands and flexibility while working as a professional and having a family with kids. Rip. <laughs> working as a professional, is that like working as a hand balance or I, professional? Is that what we're then? I assuming? think they're just mean nine to five would be my take on it. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really damn hard because you don't have so much time. Yeah. So that's like, I think be realistic with the amount of time that you have to put into it. And like work work with work with a realistic schedule rather than one that's a fairy tale. Since like yeah. you probably won't have the like I mean you can't overreach uh, your training and like it's like you can't overreach like your family time either and on your work. So it's it's important to to find some sort of of balance of that. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you if you try too hard and just like try to cram in too much training, then it is going to negatively impact something else. So yeah, it's 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 tricky. It's it's definitely a complicated thing. Um, and like that is where like how to say um, efficient training and trusting the fact that if you are if you're putting the the required stimulus onto your body you do have the time to re to recover and to actually get better by yeah. leaving it alone as well so that is a factor that is hugely <laughs> underestimated i think yeah i think it's it's also one of those things that i've worked with a lot of professionals over the years on his personal training and uh you know it's some of the advice you have to do is you do i don't know it's always like family dynamics like are your kids two or are they ten you know, these kind of things. Like if they're two year olds and they need to be supervised before they go licking sockets, then maybe you can't do this. But like setting the boundaries on your own time, even if it's two or three times a week, and just saying, This is mommy or daddy's handstand time. I'm just doing this. The other thing I would have people do, which is it worked very well, but it depends if you're an early riser and also what age your kids are, is get up before the kids are up and do your training then. This was kind of some of the mandatory rules I had for people who were doing like fat loss coaching with me back when I was doing that terrible, terrible business. And mm. uh, yeah, it was just like, cool, I want you in the gym at 6 a.m. That's it. If you're going to do this, this is the only way it's going to work because something will come up during the day if you have your session planned at like oh, four o'clock and then crash is cold and little Timmy is sick or has bit another child and you have to come in and disentangle <laughs> them. Yeah. That actually happened, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> client. yeah, one of the client's kids bit another kid so badly the other kid had to go to the hospital and had to... <laughs> uh, but yeah, setting boundaries on your own time. The other thing is like, there was one, I can remember one of my clients who uh, he just had a little daughter who was about two, two and a half, and he was learning the handstand. And he would mind her in whatever room that they had in the house, it was different every time. And he would be doing his chest to wall handstands. And by about the third phase of training we done, she was doing chest to wall handstands with daddy. <laughs> she would nice. be uh, kicking up. So, you know, kids are running around doing their thing. You don't need to entertain them. You can just do your thing, and they will kind of learn by watching you and then you'll end up with like an awesome kid who can have better than you at handstands yeah <laughs> the other there's another dirty trick here as well is enroll your kids in gymnastic classes if they're into it and then you go along and most gymnastic class over here because of the child protection safety generally the adults have to supervise the there's a certain number of adults supervising the gymnastic coaching and the classing here i think it's the same in a lot of the world well you, you can just do one of them. Yeah, you go <laughs> with them and do your Blank. Oh look, you've got access to the whole gymnastics hall with all the equipment and mats you could ever want and you can just do your training there and just uh mess around. You know. Yeah, these kind of things. Uh other than that, like flexibility training, you know, if you can do effective hmm, maybe not super you can do effective flexibility training sitting in front of TV if it's that time, you know. I don't know, maybe don't give your kids TV. But, uh, you know, if you do and it's family watch TV time, you can just sit around and just do your flexibility training. Maybe it mightn't be the most focused session, 
but it definitely will work. Yeah. Like, this is the kind of thing that, like, you can get good at stuff as a parent. Who can we think of? Elisa Balance. Check her out. Helgi. Helgi. Yeah, these two people we just listed, they have both have three children and run the gyms. And, yeah. Yeah. And three one. young children, children and are pretty damn good. So, it is possible. Yeah, I mean, it's... But, yeah, again, like, I think just wa- wa- watch, watch out for the... I mean, now I'm speaking out of my ass because I don't have kids, but like I, I just assume that there is truth in this thing around uh, people trying to be super parents and like achieving everything at the same time. And just I, I saw this great quote here. I absolutely despise quotes, but there was <laughs> this one quote that went something like, now I'm paraphrasing it, but like something like, uh, get up early. Um, eat healthy and surround yourself with only people that support you and there is no limit to how burnt out you can become. <laughs> I don't remember who said it. And I just, like a friend of mine posted some shit like that, uh, but it was a quote by someone and I think there, there is a lot to that. It's like, go get an attitude and you just like grind yourself into the ground. So, I mean, take care and take, take your time. There's, yeah, there is time as long as you don't like waste it by nuking yourself as well yeah you want to like this is the thing you want to build a hobby that you're going to do for a very long time and then you will get very good at it and if you just get fatigued or you just don't have it's better to have like something you enjoy and do it twice a week when you have like some me time versus feeling like you have to train it five days a week and it's just not realistic because you've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old and they're running around the house still and they're not in school yet and you know, whereas two sessions a week, boom, all with the grandparents. And, you know, don't be afraid to, like, be that parent as well. Like, the one who goes to the park with the kids and does some handstands there. You know, any little micro-training you can get in, because you're, you know, a lot of little micro-trainings will add up eventually. You know, yeah. there are other people, I'm saying this now, for, although other, everyone listening in will be like, ah, I can do grease the groove from a one-arm handstand. It's not exactly what it's about. It's about someone trying to fit it in. But, uh, you know, fit in what you're doing. Do some cartwheels in the park when your kids are running around. Don't be the parent hiding in the corner, sitting down doing nothing. Indeed. Yeah. We speak like geniuses on children because we have so many of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Com- complete, completely from experience here. <laughs> I think we're such failures, we don't even own cats. (laughs) Rip, rip. Uh, Someone please send me a cat. (laughs) Also, ask someone who has kids. Yeah. (laughs) They might have even more realistic uh, answers than we do. I think, uh, yeah, shout out to to, uh, one of my good friends from school. He has two kids now. And uh, we're having dinner with them and they're kind of giving out to us because we're like complaining. We're saying something like, oh, we just haven't got time to get everything done. And it's like, I don't think you understand you have so much time. You think you don't have time, but like you don't have two children and no, you have time <laughs> to do anything you want. Yeah. So uh that's the yeah. gist I get from it too. Like in the like from people who live in reality. Yeah. Uh yeah, or than that, that's the end of our Q and A. If you uh want to ask us any questions, send them to at Hansan Factory or over the contact form on the website, handsandfactory.com. If you'd like to do a bit of training with us, uh, we have our programs at handsonfactory.com. Uh, other than that, where do we wrap it up? Wrap it up here. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers.